Hello, everyone. Welcome to your Wednesday Bible study. I'm excited to be going through this uh, psalm, Psalm 111, with you guys. I think it's going to be encouraging to you. And really, it's a, it's a short and uh, powerful psalm that can encourage anybody. So I'll pray, and we'll get right into it. Father God, I ask that you would bless this time of Bible study, that uh, each verse would speak to our hearts, each verse would open our eyes to who you are, and that you would be glorified, Lord. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. All right, so it starts off very simply. Psalm 111 says, Praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. Now, something that you might notice is that these some of these words are in italics. And what that means is that in the original text, they aren't actually there. Some of those prepositions to make English flow a little more normally for us aren't there in the Hebrew or in the Greek um, Old Testament or New Testament. So uh, it's added in there, you know, in the New King James so that we can have easier sentences. Otherwise, I would say, I will praise the Lord with whole heart. It makes more sense to say with my whole heart. I, in the assembly of the upright and the congregation. And in the congregation. It's just simple grammar. If you were ever wondering. Maybe you never wondered. Uh, but notice it starts off just very simply. Praise the Lord. It's a command. It's a call to worship for all people. But then it goes into, I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. In the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. So there's this distinct reality that there's all of us praising God and we should all praise the Lord and we should come together the assembly of the upright people the congregation which would have been you know the Israelites all flocking to Jerusalem for the celebration of Passover or any other festival they all come into worship but it's not just the congregation it's not just the corporate it's the individual that's also very important you have to make that commitment that devotion to praise the Lord just like the psalmist is here I will praise the Lord, it's the covenant name for God, that's Jehovah or Yahweh, with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. So ask yourself, very simply, are you praising God with your whole heart? And secondly, are you praising God with your whole heart amongst his people? There's a special blessing when his people are gathered. Now, right now is a really interesting time that you can't really get to church like you used to, but... We still have services, outdoors, indoors, morning or evening. We're going to do whatever it takes to, to meet together. And there's a special blessing when we gather. So I want to encourage you guys to gather. If you haven't been able to, uh, start gathering. Now, picture this, just to kind of get your mind in the, in the psalm. Picture yourself as an Israelite. You've traveled for a few days to arrive to Jerusalem. You've brought with you your sacrifices for your family. You've come to worship. You've come to praise God. You've come to celebrate the festivals. Um, for example, Passover. Now, when you come, there will be this great joy in you, this kind of excitement, this like yearly, you know, big deal event. And this is kind of what we're talking about here in this psalm. This is the, the mindset, the mentality of somebody who is ready to praise God. These are the things that those who worship the Lord are focused on. So with your whole heart and with all God's people, when you gather, this is what we're focused on. The works of the Lord are great. Studied or uh, literally sought out or, or to, you know, to seek for, sought out, uh, studied by all who have pleasure in them. His work is honorable and glorious and his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered the Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He has given food to those who fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. He has declared to his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. So what's going on here? We're talking about all of God's work. In really from 2 through 4a, we kind of get you know what God's work are like, what God's works are like. And then through the rest, we kind of get what God is like. Um, the works of the Lord are great. They're huge. They're big. They're important. They're powerful. They're studied by all who have pleasure in them. I think that's a really interesting thing, that there's this innate and um, distinct joy that comes from seeking out God's work, kind of placing your mind and your thoughts 
on all the things that God does and has done, uh, uh, studying it, seeking out to know more about it, to know more of what God has done. You know, uh, replacing ignorance with uh, knowledge. And when you study God's word, when you study his character, when you go to Bible study or spend time in prayer and you, you ponder his greatness, man, you just get this deep pleasure from it, this powerful joy that comes from it. It's something that you can, you know, pass the time doing, focusing on what God has done and who he is. His work is honorable, it's glorious, and his righteousness endures forever. His wonderful works are made to be remembered. And see, this is why God made the festivals, why he planned Passover, why he um, had them celebrate the Day of Atonement. It was to remember his good work. Passover, Passover reminded them of the Exodus when they left Egypt uh, out of slavery and into freedom. Um, the Day of Atonement reminded them of his great work to forgive and to relent from, from wrath, right? Allowing them to have a connection with him. You know, he makes, he makes his wonderful works to be remembered. He asks us to remember what he's done for us and for others. And that's not just Israel. That's the church as well. You know, the Lord has asked us to ponder his goodness. You know, the simple thing we can think of right now is just communion. What did Jesus say about communion? What did the, Paul, the Apostle Paul teach about communion? It's that we're supposed to remember what he did on the cross, giving his body, shedding uh, blood, and also remember that he's returning, that he's coming again. Those are his works that we're made to remember every time we take communion. So there's this, you know, action we take to purposefully, intentionally remember. So that's what his works are like, but who, what is he like? Kind of getting deeper, not just to the things that he does, but who he is. He's gracious. He's full of compassion. He gives food to those who fear him, this kind of provision that he has for the, his loved ones. He will ever be mindful or put attention to, you know, never forget, always be faithful to his covenant. And Israel would always be thinking of God's covenant, that he call them out, that he's going to bless them, that he's going to protect them, that he's going to make out of them this great nation, that he's going to bring out of them a savior and a messiah, you know, and he doesn't forget those promises. He's declared to his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nation. So this is, this is the promised land we're talking about. This is Canaan, where they left Egypt and they were told there was this promised land for them. It was the land that was promised to Abraham, promised to Isaac, and then to Jacob, and then to the mass of Israelites who were leaving Egypt from the Exodus and going across the wandering wilderness and then into the promised land. God displays his power in giving this inheritance. Let me say that again. He displays his power in giving an inheritance to the people who follow him, to the people who trust him, the people that he calls out. The same thing happens for us believers in the modern day, for the New Testament believers. You know, God displays his power in giving us an inheritance. And what do we inherit? We inherit heaven one day. We become part of the body of Christ, being part of a, a fellowship, being believers amongst the body. We are filled with his spirit. We have forgiveness and we're going to have, you know, redeemed bodies in heaven. All these great things. Well, he displays his power by giving an inheritance. Those who trust in him receive these things. It's really simple. That's his character. That's that's what God is and what he's doing. Now, notice how in here it never says anything about how good Israel is. <laughs> Doesn't say, you know, that his people deserve what's happening. You know, they didn't deserve it. Uh, they weren't able to accomplish it on their own. In fact, they weren't even totally grateful for it every time. There's a real honest reality when we look at ourselves and we look at the good things that God has done for us. We look at his grace and his mercy and his love towards us and we realize we didn't deserve any of it. We didn't accomplish any of it. We didn't even totally thank him for all of it. You know, we're still uh, learning to be grateful every day for his mercies. And this is just because this is who he is and what he does for people who trust in him. Not because we're so great. We have nothing to offer ourselves, which is why we trust in him instead. This is the goodness of God. Verse 7. The works of his hands are verity and justice. And really, I just had to look up this word. It just means stable, kind of sure. All his precepts are sure. So it's kind of 
a double right there. Verity and sure, they're almost the same thing. So the work of God's hands are justice. They're stable, they're sure. They last forever. They stand fast forever. They're done in truth and uprightness. I mean, this is the God that we serve. He has sent redemption. This is the ransom, the buying back to his people when he calls them out of Exodus, um, out of Egypt in the Exodus, excuse me. When he calls them out of Babylon, when they leave Babylon and go back to Israel. And again, he'll do that in the future. He's commanded his covenant, his promise to Israel forever. Holy and awesome is, is his name. Fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. You know, now that we've talked about, you know, what you'll do, that you'll worship the Lord, that you'll praise him with your whole heart and amongst his people. And now that we've talked about, you know, what God is and who he's, what he's been doing and, and what he's doing for his people. Really, it just takes another paragraph on focusing in on Israel and what God has done. He's brought justice to them, freeing them from slavery, uh, bringing uh, also justice to them that the, the Passover lamb died, but yet they're the ones who are freed from their slavery of sin. That's not justice that we would think of, right? But yet because Jesus is coming one day, God can let an animal die for the moment and let there be atonement in the moment because in his forbearance, he's looking forward to when Jesus would come and die. And that's right out of Romans chapter three. His precepts are sure that the, the commandments he gives them, the teachings he gives them, like say the 10 commandments, they're sure they last forever. They stand forever. And it's done in truth and uprightness. Nothing that God did for the Israelites was immoral. Nothing he did for the Israelites was uh, a con or some sort of shady, you know, back, uh, back alley type thing. It was all upfront, honest, truthful work. And he does it all to redeem them, to redeem them, to buy them back, to bring them out of that slavery from Egypt or slavery in Babylon. He does this. He's this awesome God. And I noticed something that you might want to take some solace in right here is verse 7 and 8, that his work is justice. They're sure, his precepts, they stand forever in truth and uprightness. The absolute truth that we learn from Scripture they never go away. It was wrong to murder in during Exodus time when God gave them the Ten Commandments. That's still wrong today. It was wrong to steal back then. It's still it's it's still still it's still wrong to steal today. You know, God loves. Well, He loved then. He loves now. God is good. He was good then. He's good now. The truth of Scripture they don't change. That's the kind of foundation we have is that truth that sets us free are the things that we know and we can live, we can base our life out off of forever. It never changes. He never changes. And that's some, something we need to hold on to in this world because our world is full of this kind of relative truth mentality where, you know, you can have your story and your truth based off of uh, your experiences. And it's really all subjective and kind of personal and the idea is that if you bring some sort of facts against somebody in a discussion or a debate, or if you point out some scripture that's you know telling you right from wrong, uh, the other person can say, well, that's true for you, but not for me, which is basically saying that works for you, but not for me. It's not that it isn't true. It's that they're ignoring truth. And that kind of mentality where truth is relative and truth is subjective and you know, facts don't really matter. What matters is the feelings of the person. That's how we get into really bad places um, in churches, in societies, in families, because they don't go off of real truth as solid and foundational as the truth of Scripture, where it tells you right from wrong and what will what you'll be blessed to do or not to do. Or the truths of basic data when there's real statistics that shows you right from wrong in a decision and a policy in a uh, plan of action for a company or a church or whatever, or in the family where roles are reversed and things don't work out because parents aren't leading their kids the way they're supposed to based off scripture and based off of, you know, how things worked for generations. And now we're changing that, that kind of stuff. It just means that, you know, for you and I, 
we have an assurance of where God is taking us because we know that his word is true and that his word has commands and promises for those who follow. We just have to be obedient to the truth, not let anybody bring up their own truth to, you know, uh, push away the truth of scripture, or push away the truth of reality. So a lot of people live in a fantasy and it's sad, but, we, you know, it's important that we talk with them, encourage them and bring them to back to reality. Next, I want to also point out here, um, this verse right here, holy and awesome is his name. I think uh, it's very easy to think that, you know, another name for God is holy or another name for God is awesome. It's not really what it's saying. It's kind of backwards from that. His name is holy and awesome. So the name Jehovah is holy and full of awe. The name Yahweh is holy and full of awe. It's worthy to be praised. And then here, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, that's pretty much a, a great cross-reference out of Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, and Proverbs 9, verse 10, where it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And notice here that it says, a good understanding have all those who do his commandments. So from obedience to his commandments, doing his commandments, living up to them by the grace of God, comes understanding and wisdom. Isn't that cool? Obey and you'll understand. Not understand until, and then you can obey. There is this walk by faith. It's not walk by faith and blind faith and you'll never figure it out and you'll never understand one day and it's always this kind of fantasy that you live in. It's the exact opposite. Step out in faith and then you'll come to understand why God was calling you to move that way, to do that thing, to speak that way. Um, a lot of times as believers, we want to understand it all before we step out. We say, God, explain it to me, and then I'll go obey. <laughs> um, but that's not really the way it works. You know, you could have uh, the simplest thing, like say, for example, here at the church, we have a big soundboard. They're a little technical. Sometimes they're hard to understand. And there used to be um, a very clear way of turning things on. You have to uh, turn on certain things in a certain order. And if you don't, then you have this big pop in the sound and, you know, you can hear, you can bust a speaker that way. Um, and, you know, it's always important to have your volumes all turned down before you turn it on because then immediately you're sending all the sound through and you, you never know where it's going to be. You could pop, you could have really bad feedback, you can ruin things if you don't turn it on in the right order. But if you don't know that, and I just told you, hey, turn it on in this order. You could say, well, I'm standing closer to this, so I'm going to turn this on and then I'll double back to this, right? Um, but you could destroy something that way. <laughs> uh, the same thing like building an engine. You know, you put things in in a certain order, for the most part, so that you get things to work properly. Otherwise, things go backwards and, and they don't fit or then they don't work. If you had to have it all explained to you, then in order to obey, in order to listen to the person who's telling you what to do, then chances are you're going to end up popping a speaker or, you know, miss, you know, not building that engine appropriately. Sometimes you just have to obey and then you'll figure it out as you go. It'll make sense in it afterwards. I think that's a real encouragement for me and, and for a lot of us during this crazy time. Obey and then it'll make sense later. So really quickly, I just want to end with a really uh, interesting thing that I found as I studied it, uh, verse 3, it says, His righteousness endures forever. And verse 5, it says, He's mindful of His covenant. Ah, he will ever be mindful of His covenant. In verse 8, God's works last, stand fast forever and ever. In verse 9, He's commanded His covenant forever. And in verse 10, his praise endures forever. So just thinking about this psalm, Psalm 111, it's the faithfulness of God, it's the justice of God, it's this provision of God, and all of it is everlasting. His truth lasts forever, his commandments are forever, his righteousness is forever, and really that's the kind of God we serve. We serve the God of forever. So God bless you guys, be encouraged, obey, and then it'll make sense in the future. <laughs> Walk by faith and uh, know that God is the God of forever. He's, he sees the end from the beginning. He knows what's coming next. And 
and we can trust him forever and we can get to spend eternity with him forever as we trust in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. All right, guys, God bless you and uh, take care. Praying for you all. Bye.